I have a question. Yeah. Sabrina, Are yeah. there any current um, efforts to get rid of the eradicate the nutria? Yes, there's yeah. So um, uh, there's various ones. Primarily, uh, the best approaches are very similar to dealing with things like um, like uh, the pythons and the anacondas type stuff in the Everglades, where we have a bounty on them. So there's been various efforts at time to, and there's still efforts now to try to induce um, a new a sort of culinary uh, consumption of of nutria and some kind of like fancy like here's some great recipes making barbecue nutria and this and that to try to try to drive an industry uh where people would want to harvest them to eat them and sell them to tourists or stuff like that um have you ever eaten that, one what's that have you ever eaten one no i'd like to but i've not <laughs> i've not i've i've i've, I've found them as roadkill i found a lot of dead ones <laughs> the time and i've seen them in the swamps but I, I i've never actually eaten one which i'd like to um, so there's various programs. Unfortunately, they, they seem to kind of historically at least have waxed and waned with the, with the funding of the state of um, Louisiana. So they'll pay people a bounty. So if you bring, I forget, if they bring a paw or whatever, they prove that they've killed one, but, but they, um, so they pay a certain number per head. Um, and so hunters will go out and get them. Um, um, and that's you know that's that's great, but really you need that to be really sustainable. And so you need to you need a constant source of money for that, or you need to like, for example, invent an industry that has a demand for it that people go out and get them. Um, but yeah, no, I've not I've not tasted them. There's there's a there's a great uh, documentary I watched about a year and a half ago on on essentially that problem the, the issue and and they also cause problems not just for not just for um, uh, you know the environment, but if they get they there can be like rats and stuff in cities and stuff too. And so they can cause problems with, with infrastructure. And so there's dudes that, uh, well, the only people I've seen are dudes. There might well be um, women doing the same exact job, but, but uh, there's sort of like the pest control folks that come out. Like when you got a rat infestation or an ant infestation, except they'll also come out and get alligators and the nutria out of your, out of your property. If you have some crazy uh, nutria. So. Yeah, cool. All right, so everybody's back. So, okay, so that was all lead up to Katrina. Let's talk about what happened with Hurricane Katrina. Um, and okay, so as we said uh, uh, a previous day, um, going into 2005, we already knew it was probably gonna be pretty bad, right? We had all these predictions and we had, and the conditions were such that things were gonna be, were really primed for some really, you know, ideal, hurricane uh, uh, seasons, ideal hurricane uh, generation, promotion, intensity, et cetera. Um, not only that, but we also had lots of warnings. So uh, while we're not gonna focus on this too much in this class, in my, my New Orleans class, we talk about this a lot, but suffice it to say there, there's various, um, uh, after, the, uh, after the fact, various people try to spin things and say, and we see this a lot also with wildfires, with earthquakes, with other things, which is that, oh, well, we didn't know. You know, well, was, well you know, sorry. It was, well, I, or you'll hear, we had no idea. This was unprecedented. We weren't, nobody could have been ready for this. Complete BS. Three things in the lead up. So again, this is 2005. This is not that long after 9-11. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, the federal agency that, that's going to come in when we have our earthquake or you know, our wildfires, whatever, and help you out and your family out, they had three high um, probability events that were, that were predicted to be hugely impactful to the economy, to the society, et cetera, um, in the lead up to 2005. Anyone want to guess what those three things were? Wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat what you're asking? Yeah, sorry. So, so, so FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the, the federal entity that deals with disaster response, um, you know, they're, they're working on everything. They're working on flooding and, and hurricanes and this and that. But they, from their research, they identified three potential events that could be catastrophic that they would have to respond to that not only would be catastrophic, but had the possibility of having huge economic you know, countrywide implications and, you know, huge costs and huge 
uh, potential loss of life, et cetera. So you guys want to make a guess what those three high or, or, or three most planned for uh, events were? Let's say one is hurricanes. Yeah, but specifically a hurricane. So number one was a terrorist attack in New York City. So like probably like a nuclear attack or something like that, right? Set off a dirty bomb or something like that. Um, uh, earthquake in California, particularly Southern California, but, but earthquake in, in San Francisco, LA, San Diego, you know, the, the big uh, population centers of California. And number three was a hurricane making a direct strike on New Orleans. So those were the things that, that the agency said, these are, you know, we hope these don't happen. And th there's maybe, you know, low prob probability they're gonna happen any one particular year, but if the, when they do happen, they're gonna be massive and we need to be ready for it. So the feds knew. Not only did the feds knew, all of the academic community was, was banging drums and telling people about this. Emergency planners were worried about this. And a, 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 a earthquake called Hurricane George came through and at the last minute it turned away. Uh, this, this, is, this is before Katrina. So it did not strike New Orleans. They thought it might, maybe it was gonna strike New Orleans. And this is from that article. Um, so this was the predicted storm track. The red dot was the predicted storm track. And we know because of the way uh, 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 winds flow in hurricanes in the Northern hemisphere, that we'd be taking up, and in this case, particularly challenging because the water, the winds fetch. I don't know if we talked about fetch in this class so far, but fetch is the amount of area the wind is blowing over water. So if we have a little teeny tiny, um, so you can imagine if we're blowing a fan on a cup of water, right? If you had the fan here, there'd be some waves on my, my cup, but they'd be kind of, you know, smally waves. If we had that same fan blowing over a big tub or a bathtub, you get much larger waves because that wind can drag and pull and have more friction effect on that water. Same thing out in nature. So for example, because we have Lake Pontchartrain here, if that hurricane had gone right over the city as predicted, it would have had a huge buildup of waves and would be smashing the waves into the Lake Pontchartrain side of the flood protection system. So, so this was from the, uh, this is from a series of articles uh, in called Washing Away in the Times Picayune, which was used to be the newspaper of record until they were bought out. That's a whole story. They, they, they ticked off a, a wealthy guy from Baton Rouge. And so he ultimately destroyed the paper, but that's another story. Um, so, so, um, so uh, uh, this appeared and, and it's hard to explain, but everybody in New Orleans read the Times Picayune. So this was what everybody read. Everybody got it. It was, it was incredibly devoted followership, readership, et cetera. So this, everybody in the city saw this in 2002. So three years before Katrina, huge series of sto stories, very in-depth, fantastic graphics, the most, the most updated modeling. Um, what would happen if a hurricane like this hit the city? And basically they predicted what was gonna happen. And this is what Hurricane Katrina looked like when it came in. So here we are, we're starting over here. Boom, we go over to the tip of Florida and then it intensifies, intensifies, intensifies. There's the eye, boom, right up. It could have been a bit worse if it had gone to the, a little bit more to the left, um, but still it was hugely impactful. Let's watch it again. So this is, this is a time-lapse obviously. But so here we're starting out here, it's coming over the Antilles, hits Florida, intensifies, 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 boom, Hurricane five. And then it starts slowing down and by the time it hits the, the boot tip of Louisiana, it's a, a category three. Um, initially with hurricanes, we're using Katrina as the example, but initially we have the, the key first impacts. That's the dramatic stuff that the weather person is out there is leaning against the wind saying, oh my God, it's the craziest thing in the world, right? It's all that kind of jazz. This you wanna be very, very far from right? Ideally way far away. If you had, if you're stuck in the city, whatever, you want to be inside a really strong structure. Do not want to be out and about. So these guys are out in this balcony, not a good place to be. 
Um, uh, you don't want to be near anything that is potentially collapsible. So in this case, this brick wall is collapsed on these series of cars. We talked before about the storm surge. Storm surge, huge problem. The water just rises and stays risen for hours and hours and hours. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, a street called Canal Street, a main street on, on one edge of basically the French Quarter. And you see these folks are all walk around flooded, right? So, so you can get flooding from a couple of things. You can get flooding from the storm surge. You also get a huge dumping of rain. So you get regular rain flooding. You get ra r risen sea level flooding. You also get wind flooding. And then you get the combination of those things can compromise whatever levees or flood protection that exists naturally or you've augmented. And that can allow water in. So all these sources allow destruction, et cetera. One of the biggest problems with uh, hurricanes in a structure is when the, when the building is intact, it's relatively OK. But as soon as you have a, a, a pinprick or a break in that, let's say a window blows out or a door, door uh, gets opened or whatever, then that allows uh, a huge change in pressure and can, uh, with poorly constructed housing can actually pop the roof right off of a building or blow out other windows and stuff. And then um, once the roof goes, that can severely compromise the structural integrity of your walls and, and that kind of stuff. So that cause just all kinds of problems start snowballing when we have these things. So we have the initial impact, which is the storm itself hitting. Um, and, and again, this is one of the most intense hurricanes. Um, uh, so not meaning not just how fast the winds are blowing, but also the scale. We talked before about the basin wide scale, scale. So check it out. So this is the satellite image over lane. So you see the band of clouds goes from about Florida all the way into Texas. This was a huge swath of a storm. And uh, the initial area that was declared a disaster area is a little area over here in Florida, but we don't care about Florida for this talk. Uh, so I've made this guy slightly pink hashed, right? So all this area, the entirety of the state of Louisiana, uh, natural disaster area, uh, and then good chunks of uh, uh, Alabama, and uh, more than half of the state of Mississippi is a disaster area. Now we've not talked about federal disaster declarations. In short, um, this is a um, uh, request that's made from the locals, from the state to the feds, and if approved, the, the it has to have presidential approval. If the president approves, then that makes um, uh, funding and different levels of assistance available to those impacted regions. Any type of disaster can trigger this. So it can be a freeze, it could be a flood, it could be a wildfire, it could be an earthquake, whatever, but it's not automatic. So you do have to generate the request and the administration has to uh, accept it. And for, and for scale here, here is imposed over here. Here's the state of California, right? So check it out. So we're talking about half the, if this had happened here, we're talking, you know, almost uh, half the state of California in terms of acreage. So this is a large area that was impacted by this one storm. Um, okay, so now the, now the, the storm is, and you guys did interrupt me if I'm going too fast. So boom, initial impact, uh, some people killed outright, uh, structures compromised, all this and that. Then, then the, the storm makes its way past. Okay, now we start finding, oh my God, there's all this flooding in the wake. So uh, now there's, there's some myths that happen here. Um, initially what happens is uh, the reporters, we're all the reporters. The reporters like to drink, right? If I was a reporter, I'd like to drink. Um, so they're all hanging out in the French Quarter, right? The, the, the fancy old hotels and nice hotels, the expensive, the touristy, most touristy parts of and wealthiest parts of New Orleans are the parts closest to the river, the high ground, the levee ground. That's, that's the most expensive prized land. And so these reporters that are there, they're covering this disaster, um, they're mostly staying in their hotel. When the, the hurricane's hitting, they're not gonna be out in the winds. You can die, right? You can get hit by a, uh, by a you know, branch and be killed. So they're all hanging out, drinking uh, mint juleps or, or I don't know, some type of uh, hurricane drink or something, or a beer or a wine or a soda or a Coke or something, if, they're, if that's their, their thing. And um, so they're hanging out, right? They're hanging out in their, in their hotels. 
nothing seemed to happen. So the storm passes, they come out of the hotels and they're like, boo, did, we're great. I mean, there's some water here and there and things are wet and everything's blown around and things broken, but they're like, wow, we survived. That was, that was crazy. The city was compromised. The city was broken. It was in the process of flooding, but that flooding was happening in areas that were so impacted. Um, initially, that information did not get out. And so the information that first was coming out was from these folks at the high ground. They're like, wow, it was crazy, but we survived. Then reports start coming in. Why? Because the city was flooding. So here we see these, this housing stock, and these are, these are roofs that are basically underwater or close to being underwater. Here is a compromised levee. And so we see the water flowing in and flowing over the levee. Here's another levee. This is on London Avenue Canal. So this is one of those canals. This is one of those few canals that is not covered. We were just talking about before. So this is, this is um, uh, you know, a, a flood protection barrier. This was a flood protection barrier. And these walls are about, uh, let's see, from the ground, if, I, if we were standing against that wall, it'd be about 15 feet high or so, right? On top of the already elevated you know, buildup of soil. So this is supposed to be a really high barrier, um, but check it out. Over here, these, 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 uh, this is flooded. And right here, you can see this entire flood wall collapsed and fell into these people's houses. And you can see the water is actually flooding in. You see that sort of like, it looks like a, um, like a, 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 a rapid, right? So the water is flooding from the canal out. What's supposed to happen is this is the drainage canal. The water is pumped in here over farther to the right. It's supposed to be draining out this way to the, to the left to Lake Pontchartrain. So you start seeing scenes like this where people are getting around in boats in city streets. And we of course have to use the Coast Guard to get people. In fact, um, so screwed were people that they used our friend's uh, GIS lab at Louisiana State at the former hurricane center when Louisiana used to have a hurricane center before they deleted it because they were so embarrassed and didn't want to tick off the powers that be. That's another story. Um, so they, um, so they base so everybody was, every, everybody was nuked, right? And they said, hey, we need help. People can't get to, people can't, rescuers can't physically get in, right? So the, the folks that want to come, the, the Coast Guard, the, the National Guard, they're actually the National Guard's barracks flooded and all their high water equipment was not usable. Um, so we have the Coast Guard flying in and people are saying, where are we, right? And so they end up, uh, switching 911 over to the GIS lab at LSU, another part of the state, and the, the technicians translated the street address to a latitude and longitude, and then would call back the 911 dispatch and say, that person was at latitude X, longitude Y, and then the Coast Guard would fly to that X and Y to find the person that needed to be rescued. So crazy stuff, completely crazy. So the city drowned. 80% of the city would eventually be submerged. So what are we looking at here? Okay, so, so uh, here is Lake Ponch Train right here. Here is the Mississippi River. Again, here's that Crescent City. Or here's, I mean, here's like the bend in the river, the Crescent, crescent, uh, crescent Bend. And what we're looking at here is uh, depth of the water when it was on the city. So this is, this is day five after the hurricane struck. And this is how deep is the water. So right, this bright green is six to seven feet deep. You guys with me? This blue, this sort of bluish area is 10 to 15 feet deep. Um, the orange is about two to three feet deep, right? So, so uh, the, the black indicate the levee system, right? So where we have a levee, where we have a structure that's trying to contain um, the floodwaters. And so again, the, the expensive land up here on the natural levee, on the natural high ground was generally okay. It was not underwater at day five. It might be wet, might've been soaked with rainwater, but it wasn't, it wasn't underwater. All these other areas underwater and some of these areas significantly underwater. Um, now at the time people were saying it might take six months to drain the city, right? So the idea was you had, once, once the, once the breaches happened, the plan was allow the water to equilibrate. There's nothing, you can't stop this water, right? So, so the water's flooding in. Once the water reaches equivalency, so the inside and outside are the same height, then we can plug the holes 
then we can start pumping the water out. And so, some estimates were about six months to get the city dewatered again. But by day 21, massive Herculean efforts, fantastic work by so many volunteers and, 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 and uh, municipal employees and all kinds of folks, National Guard, it was down to this. So still three days later, these areas underwater. These areas, for example, out here towards New Orleans East are the poorest areas of the city, right? So um, again, the more marginalized community, the less wealthy, the less empowered, right? Uh, those folks are gonna be in the less desirable areas and those are the, one, those are the areas that flooded more or were more likely to flood. So here's a quote from Ken Watts. So he's in his house. So check it out. That, there's his house. And he's, he's about knee high, right? And he's on the, the top step to his house. So he's knee high, that high in his house. And this is six days after the hurricane struck. And so he said, it was time to leave when the skin on my fingers and legs started to peel off, right? So um, th there's that you should not be in this water, right? And imagine what would happen in your house if all of a sudden, there's three feet of water in your garage, right? Paints, oil and gas from your car, um, uh, uh, who knows what all else in your garage and in, in your kitchen and everything. Now that stuff's floating around, not just yours, but your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's just, and you can see it right here. And this, like, just looking at this picture, see all the, uh, I hope you guys can on Zoom. I don't know if you can, but, but you know, this sort of just oily sheen over everything, just totally nasty completely unsafe. Next phase that we see, um, and, and, and this is not unique to Katrina, but anytime we have these disasters that go on an extended period of time, so not like boom, tornado, boom, done, but something like this uh, massive disaster that we saw with Katrina that goes for days and days and days and days. So first and foremost, um, you'll hear that people will say things like, well, those, those idiots should have evacuated. Yes, everybody should have evacuated uh, from New Orleans, but the, the reality is the vast majority of people did. The folks that did not, um, there's a few that just said, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride it out. But by and large, those folks that did not evacuate did not have their own vehicles or had medical conditions where it was difficult to leave or, or other compounding factors. So most folks that didn't leave weren't opting to stay in the city they either, they just didn't have the means or there was some logistical problems with getting them out. And we need to think about that in any kind of disaster. That we can't just talk about the folks that have their own helicopter to helicopter them out, but the folks that um, you know, rely on Uber all the time, right? Ain't gonna be in a, an Uber after the earthquake, for example, right? So one of the things that happens is people migrated to um, uh, some uh, emergency shelters the emergency shelters, uh, the big ones, for example, the convention center that you, you might hear, I've heard a lot about, or um, the big football stadium, uh, those were no longer considered approved evacuation centers. In years past, they were, but um, the American Red Cross came up and said, you know what, these are not, what is it, Red Cross or FEMA? I can't remember, one of them. I can't remember who did it, but they, but they basically said, um, these buildings can't withstand a, a super strong hurricane, so we're no longer going to have these be the place where people rally to if their house gets flooded. The problem was there wasn't anywhere else, and people knew them from previous years, so people started going to these places. There was not, there was no water, there was no medicine, and so you had people just starting to die in these areas, um, and, and it just was absolutely horrible, horrible stuff. Any guesses as to what this might be? So we're looking at a uh, freeway on-ramp and the freeways, uh, at least in this part of sort of urban New Orleans, a lot of them are raised up. Um, so we're looking at essentially an entry, an, an on-ramp to this one uh, part of the freeway. I, I don't remember if this is the 10 or what this one is, but um, any guesses as to what we're looking at here? What's on the ramp here? Is that just like a like a safe zone, like in lieu of that of the buildings? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, so it's high ground, so people are on there. But but any guesses to which people, what people are on there? Prisoners. So the jail was going subtitle. 
So they evacuate all the prisoners because they were all they would have all drowned. So all these folks are some of which are really bad people, some of which were just, I don't know, drunk last night and got arrested, but they're all being held by guards with shotguns. And this is day three of 90 plus degree temperature and uh, 90 plus uh, humidity. Ain't no shade there, right? So, you know, an hour or two of that would be crazy. A day or two of that'd be crazy. Going on to days and days, it, it this is tough conditions. Here you see some families looking to get out. Again, no vehicles, or maybe if they had a vehicle, at least it's probably flooded now and doesn't work. So they're just walking out in a major American city days after a disaster, and nobody is helping these folks, or very few people are helping these folks. Over here, I, I can't remember picture so old. I think this was a Walgreens, if I remember correctly. And so, um, so what you see here is this guy is, so people are wanting food, right? So there was some folks that broke in and were taking shoes and TVs and stuff of that nature. But by and large, most of what was going on were these folks going to stores, getting formula for their babies, getting water, right? So, so this guy is, is a security guard and he's not shooting at anybody he's saying hey chill right you know like you can take your stuff but don't you know be shoving people etc so there's there's um all this kind of social breakdown right when there's when nobody's there to help you and this and that the next phase is we realize how intensely the infrastructure is compromised so again how do you get around you have to get around in a canoe or a boat all kinds of debris massive debris which causes the state and the feds to suspend a lot of environmental laws in terms of dumping so we can just take stuff and put it in the dump, for example, because there's just such a massive quantity of material that have to be, has to be removed before you can even start doing like power line repair. It's a huge thing. You get things like this oil rig now on land that blew in land. Um, you get massive amounts of oil and gas uh, uh, petroleum uh, uh, facilities flooded, and so that oil is flooding out. And you get things like, I don't know, a barge now is now on the road. Um, this, was, uh, this is actually Mississippi, not Louisiana, but, but that kind of stuff happens. And then you, we see fires breaking out. So natural gas lines break, catch fire. Uh, in this case, this is a refinery, on, an oil and gas refinery on fire. And just, you know, very, very challenging situations. Um, so I'm going to play uh, this little guy next. And this is um, just to give you guys a sense of what was going on, this is a snippet from the news hour on day 10. So um, so let me know as I start playing this, make, make sure you guys can hear this in terms of uh, through your speaker. I think you should be able to hear it, no problem, but let me just, but if it doesn't work, you guys interrupt me and I'll, I'll try to reset it. So here we go. You guys hear that? Still, yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Removing the living from New Orleans. We begin with this report from Jeffrey Kay of KCET Los Angeles. We may not be back in this area. They're talking 60 to 80 days before the water goes down. I understand. So I, I strongly urge you to get out now. Coaxing residents to abandon their homes is not in the job description of Louisiana State Wildlife and Fisheries Agents. I understand you're loyal to see your animals. But you're going to run out of food and water, and, and you need to take care of yourself right now. Normally, this time of the year, game wardens would be out in the countryside for the opening of the dove hunting season. But with some 60% of the city of New Orleans waterlogged, their department has dispersed a flotilla of flat bottom boats for search and rescue missions. A lot of locals are used to flooding, and they still think this thing's going to go down in a couple of days. So we're having a hard time getting in their head. This could still be a few weeks before we get, even with them pumping out right now, getting all the water out. Even leave. if it's a real right. serious, serious medical issue, then leave. we may force them to leave. Yeah. So if you could tell our airboat operator, he's number one, you're number two. And when we get to 27, we're going to start sending them out to the east. Teams from Louisiana and around the south have used hundreds of boats. Armed personnel, including sheriff's deputies from as far away as Albuquerque, 
provided escorts. Officials say the heavy weaponry and bulletproof vests were necessary protection. They worried about a repeat of earlier incidents in which snipers had fired at police and aid workers. So that wasn't true. As in law enforcement, I know with a dream I'd have to wear body armor to come rescue people, unfortunately. But, you know, I think the last few days have gotten it under control. We really haven't had any incidents. And, uh, but you're wearing it. It's I'm wearing it because concern. you don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that's been in here for a week, and I'm sure there might be a sense of cabin fever, and they're, they're just, they don't know who to trust maybe at this point. This operation yesterday was in southwest New Orleans, close to the Garden District. Throughout the city, the waters are gradually receding, but they're contaminated by toxics and waste. And the flooded neighborhoods lack basic services, including communication. Many stranded residents haven't heard about the extent of the damage, and thousands have insisted on staying put. Yeah, so the water, yeah, well, you know, it's going to rise up a little bit, but I didn't expect it to go this bad, so... By the time it got to this point, I was like, well, I might as well just stay. Why? Uh, it really ain't no bother to me. Do you have any power? No, sir. Running water? No, sir. Sewage? No, sir. Because I, I make do somehow, some way. Independent of state agents, National Guard troops conducted their own search and rescue operations in heavy trucks. The U.S. Coast Guard patrolled from the air, and private boat owners came to offer aid. Shannon Gamewell brought his boat to New Orleans from Arkansas to be a nautical good Samaritan. I just talked to my wife, and I said, look, if you were here and Hallie was here, I would want somebody like me coming to get you. You know, and, and that's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm just a redneck with a mud buddy, you know, but in this type of situation, that helps. We got transportation that we leave. We just get to that corner go down, then we start rolling out. Gamewell came across Shirley Johnson and her family and loaned her his cell phone so she could call her daughter in Atlanta. You know her phone Tiffany, this is Shirley. Yay! We still at home. We wait for the water to go down. I'm so glad to hear from y'all because we've been thinking and worried. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's okay, Charlie. It's all right. It's okay. So we're gonna be doing Later, as seen in video shot by a news hour producer, Gamewell encountered Warren Mahoney, a stroke patient. Since I had this stroke, okay? you know, I need my medication and stuff like right that. Yeah, I got enough medicine last two couple of days. But I need that blood pressure medicine. Now you stand right there. Okay, put your cane down and, and I mean use it, use your cane, lean on your cane, because I'm coming. I've got to come up, okay? Gamewell helped Mahoney to his boat. Flag down a passing Air Force helicopter. And helped carry the disabled man to the chopper so he could be evacuated. Game wardens hoping to find more residents like Mahoney yell through open doors and windows. The welfare of pets was a main reason many people chose not to evacuate. Carolyn Mitchell was worried about the fate of the animals in the house she shared with three other people. How long do you figure you can stay here? Uh, another couple of days. So, that, I mean, we're, we've been trying to get out and make plans, so... Eventually, game wardens persuaded the residents to put their own safety before that of their animals. They quickly packed belongings and were evacuated. In the next few days, officials may use more than persuasion. The New Orleans mayor has ordered all residents to leave the city. Margaret Warner. Okay, so um, so that was day ten of, you know, that wasn't the next day. That was 
That was a week and a half after still looking for people, still reaching out. At this point, it's not really so much become a hurricane story. It's become a massive natural disaster. Similar responses can be expected when we have our earthquakes or, or something of that nature. Um, so a couple things real quick just to clarify there. Um, when they said people were shooting at law enforcement officers, that was not true. That was an example of rumors and, and, and misinformation spread around. And so, uh, unfortunately, by the police themselves also. Um, so if we watch the next segment, you would have heard the, the then chief of police of New Orleans say that, you know, some people have shot at their officers. That was not true. But that induced a slower response to get to people because people were because um, first responders were worried that maybe they were getting shot at, etc. So, Okay. Ultimately, though, what we see is, oh, sorry, was there any other, other questions about that before we go on? I'm, I'm just sort of trying to go rapidly through this, probably too rapidly. Does that make any, any questions about that or the initial response? Why couldn't yeah. people take their pets? Hmm. Oh, great question. That's something that's changed now. So um, the American Red Cross does not, at the time, would not allow any animals into a shelter unless it was a um, uh, like a seeing eye dog. And, and, you know, if you have snakes, if you have cats, if you have dogs, if you have rabbits, if you have whatever, the, you just can't bring them in. And so we also see that uh, raising that issue in the context of homeless folks as well. So a lot of our homeless shelters say no animals because they've had experience with people's animals biting somebody or whatever, right? So they, hey, don't do that. But what we found with one of the many things we learned with Katrina, um, we kind of knew it ahead of time, but just solidified the, it in people's minds is that people would not abandon their animals, right? So if you're an older couple, kids are gone, you have this dog you've had for 10 years, you you feel super dedicated, you know, they're, they're, they're a member of your family, right? So people are like, I'm not leaving my dog, right? Or my cat or my bird or whatever it is. And, you know, in the vac, in the, Coast Guard isn't going to take your dog with you, right? They're like, dude, we get, got hardly any room on this, on this helicopter. We're going to take you and maybe a small bag, and that's it. So um, now, in response, we see this with wildfires as well. So now one of the first things you'll hear, uh, for example, for us here in California, when we have a wildfire, which is our most frequent uh, you know, large-scale natural disaster these days, they'll say, the first thing they'll say is, hey, if you have a large animal like horses, um, you can take them to, in our, in our part of the world, it's usually the Ventura uh, Fairgrounds. For up in Santa Barbara, it's the Earl Warren Showgrounds. Um, and there's, a, there's other places around. And so they'll say, if those kind of animals go there, um, the county animal shelter will take your dogs. You know, temporarily, you can take them there and drop them off um, and that type of stuff. Um, and then in addition, now uh, 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 evacuation shelters, emergency shelters, will oftentimes take animals, not every single shelter, but there will be a shelter in an area that will be designated to take animals so people can go there. So that, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that turned out to be a huge thing. Other questions about that? Yeah, has there been a lot of research on how much pollution comes from hurricanes where you were talking about the paints and oils? Yeah, so I have, I'll have, some, I'll have some data I'll show you in a second. We need way more. So we find this with our own work on wildfires. Um, it, um, <clears throat> so I'll just give an example. So with wildfires, one of the biggest problems we, we believe with water quality in rivers is the, the ash, the, the little floating flakes, the, the gray flakes that come right off the fire. Um, we think those are going to hit, the, the, those hit the water and rapidly change the acidity of the water and make it really toxic and challenging for insects and, and fish and stuff. But that stuff disappears almost instantly, right? As soon as it hits the water, it's gone. It lands on the, um, lands on the soil surface and dew the next morning even, you know, can make that disappear. So if you're not out there, you know, in minutes or hours, you may well miss that measuring that signal. And, and the same thing with other substances. If, if you're not, if we're not allowed, if we researchers aren't allowed to go in and take samples, it's hugely problematic. We can't get samples. So in the case of wildfires, we usually try to get in and we're usually blocked. Like, nope, 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 nope. Because the general default answer is nope. Everybody out. Are you, are you press? No. Are you first responders? No. Then you can't come in here, right? 
which is understandable, right? They're trying to manage the situation. They want to get all people out of there so they're not compromised. They don't have to go rescue them. But what it means is getting the data is really, really, really hard. And so the same thing with New Orleans. When this happened, everybody's get the hell out, right? And only, you know, after a day, because everybody's first and foremost worried about people just dying, right? And all the resources are going to helping people correctly, you know, all those resources are getting people's, people out. People aren't stopping grabbing a, you know, a, an acid washed bottle and, and sampling so we can look at the metal level. So it's usually a significant period of time later that the environmental impact assessment sort of can kind of come in. Um, so the best, the best senses that we have in terms of um, natural disaster impacts are long-term study sites that are already being monitored, ideally with some type of automated water collection, air sample, or something like that, that, is, that are going on. And then the storm, the, the impact, whatever goes around it, and the, the devices survive. So for example, we've had some of that in places like Puerto Rico, where hurricanes have hit, and we've seen how the water quality and streams changes, you know, as the hurricane is hitting and then the immediate aftermath and the immediate you know, weeks and stuff afterwards, um, because people wouldn't be allowed in there, right? So, so those automated type of long-term monitoring responses are usually our best, our best bet. Other questions? Okay, the other thing we see is we see with Katrina, again, so we're talking about Katrina, but really is there, hopefully we're spending so much time on this, because really this extended, intense, extended disaster is really, I think, a harbinger for future disasters um, and, and sort of gives us some sense of how they would play out. So um, then we see out of touch leadership. OK, um, now this doesn't always have to be the case, but in the case of uh, Katrina, this that's what happened. So, for example, um, people started evacuating when they when they were evacuating, they went to various regional centers. One of the largest was Houston. Um, and so, uh, people that could go to Houston, went to Houston, people that couldn't eventually <clears throat> we get buses going and this and that and get people there. So, so large areas like convention centers, football stadiums, that kind of stuff. And so, um, uh, former first lady, Barbara Bush, president, uh, George W. Bush is the president at the time she goes and, uh, this is a classic case, right? So, so she visits evacuees in Houston's Astrodome. And, and she says, uh, not trying to be a jerk, right? Not trying to be a jerk, but this is, you can imagine the impact of this. She said, what I'm hearing this is after talking to evacuees that have just lost maybe everything they own um, and are in a different city, maybe don't know anybody in the city. She said, what I'm hearing, which is sort of scary is that they all wanna stay in Texas, meaning the Louisiana folks. Everyone is so overwhelmed by the hospitality and so many of the people in the arena here, you know, we're underprivileged anyway. So this is working well for them, right? Um, hmm, it's an interesting way to comfort people, right? Saying, oh, they're poor. So in fact, we're giving them some food now. It's like, that's an improvement. Um, and then uh, the then uh, House Majority Leader, who was um, subsequently touring the same facility, was talking to some little kids that were evacuated and you know, tr tr I guess trying to be positive and describe, tell me boys, tell me the truth. Isn't this kind of fun? Again, super out of touch, right? Very much so out of touch with, with how people were actually responding. Yeah, Sabrina. Um, yeah, my boyfriend, um, he lived in Texas when he was, he went to high school there. And he always tells me stories about, he remembers like how, how much racism and just all the crazies, the way that the Texans viewed the refugees from Louisiana and how hard it was for the kids who came to his high school and stuff and saw that kind of stuff. Yeah, a huge amount of racism. I do not want to imply that everybody in Texas was racist. They were not, but but the, nevertheless, there is a there was a, a very significant chunk of folks and responses that were get away, you smelly people, you others, you non us, you, you, you folks that aren't worthy of our compassion. So that was absolutely a, a, a part of it. Absolutely. And that's what these are. That's what these quotes are pointing out. Uh, the then director of FEMA. And again, if you take my class, we'll talk about this a lot more, but um, the director of FEMA, who's Highest profile previous position was as the head of a horse association. 
um, very little. He would he says that oh he did some work for he was a lawyer he did some work for this one agency one time, but nevertheless not qualified. I think is a is a is a generous way to say it. Not qualified to run the federal emergency management agency, a so-called political appointee. In other words, not someone who's trained and expert in this discipline, but is rather someone that's getting a political favor for this position. And so this is from emails that the director of FEMA was sending around that we later were released for the Freedom of Information Act. And he says, if you look at my lovely FEMA, he's talking about he's because he's on television all the time. If you look at my lovely FEMA attire, you'll really vomit. I am a fashion god. Anything specific I need to do or tweak about his appearance. Do you know anyone who dog sits? Can I quit now? Can I come home? I'm trapped now. Please rescue me, right? This is the person that's supposed to be in charge of rescuing folks. And people are, they don't even know that they're, well, they, they claim they don't even know there's, you know, tens of thousands of people in the convention center and the stadium and all these places. Um, it's just crazy. And then there's this famous quote by President Bush uh, to Director Brown, the head of the FEMA. Um, and he says, Brown, you're doing a heck of a job. And that becomes uh, a meme that becomes, we didn't really have, we didn't call them memes at the time, but it becomes this, this thing that's repeated over and over and over and over and over. And, um, and, and, and the, the sort of appearance of incompetence and the appearance of of, of not caring and, and not engaged and all this stuff just continues to, to go for days upon days upon days. And so when um, uh, Nancy Pelosi is having a meeting with um, uh, the president about, you gotta get somebody else in there who's competent to run FEMA, um, President Bush said, what didn't go right? Again, massive American city flooded, people not, being helped uh, for days and days and days on end, crazy. Um, and then on, on NPR, famously, um, the then director of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, is talking to the, the host, and he says, so what's up with all these people in the convention center? And the head, this is this on national television every night. This is on live streaming of, you know, reporters talking on CNN and Fox News and NBC and everything under the planet, radio, newspapers, everything. They're streaming it live in the BBC. They're streaming it live in Canada. And uh, he says, what about these, these people in the convention center? And the, the head of Homeland Security says on September 1, I've not heard a report of thousands of people in the convention center who don't have food or water. So if the head of the agency that was formed specifically to defend us if we get attacked by some horrible terrorist attack. And one of the three gamed, planned, anticipated events plays out and you're unable to get the most basic information, something is deeply dysfunctional with the, the infrastructure, the political response, the, the, the management, the crisis management aspects of stuff. And it was just, it's hard to describe to you guys how insane this was to watch this play out every day horrible that this would happen in beirut horrible something like this would happen in bangladesh um uh, somalia anything like that unacceptable anywhere but particularly unacceptable in our country which is so wealthy and so prepared and so so uh knew that these things could happen and the fact that we were this incompetent deeply concerning deeply concerning um, okay, so have been talking for a while now. We're almost up to our next break. Um, so I'll just go a little bit and we'll take another pause here. But um, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is some of the disparities that were going on. And so again, orient us. Here's Lake Pontchartrain up north. Here's the Crescent City Bend. And so this is the sort of main chunk of New Orleans. Um, we had areas that um, did well in the wake of, and I mean, now I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, significant time after the the um, the hurricane struck, but we had some areas that recovered populations, some areas that lost, and we see this having um, a clear racial undertone. Before Hurricane Katrina hit, um, the Brookings Institute creates this this index or, the, or this measure of concentrated poverty. So, what do we mean by concentrated poverty? We mean uh, not not how poor your town is but how concentrated are the poor folks? Are folks of low income sort of salt and peppered across your community? 
or are they all in one neighborhood, right? Are they on the quote unquote wrong side of the tracks? So what we find there is these are the 10, uh, the, the uh, cities with 100,000 people or more in the US that had the highest concentration of poverty before Hurricane Katrina hit, so in 2005. Fresno here in California had the highest. New Orleans, number two in the nation. So New Orleans is, was second most when Katrina hit of the folks that are least able to respond concentrated in, in, in certain neighborhoods and certain districts. And so we very quickly start to see um, these, sto these stories related to race start to pour out. One of the first things that we hear is, is this, that, that the stuff started being reporting that, oh, what's going on is anytime there's a white person that's, as we, we, we mentioned, right, that there's definitely looters that were looting stuff, stealing stuff just for the sake of stealing stuff. But, um, you know, there's a-holes everywhere. But um, the, the vast majority of stuff was were folks getting something because they, they needed to survive, right, or their kid needed to survive or something. Having said that, there were various stories starting to come out about this, right? It's, it's, a, it's a dramatic thing, looting, right? That's a dramatic thing to get on television. And, you know, it's understandable why that stuff kind of makes it into the news or photographs. But it started being reported in that when it was white folks, they were talking about, this is a, a French news agency. It was re re reported that these folks were finding materials. But when, when it was African-American folks, the terms are more like looting of stuff. And this caused a huge sensation and people are like, this is totally racist and everything. Um, absolutely, that happened to an extent, but when after the fact, we've done a much more rigorous analysis, this is not true. So when you look at all the stories that were coming out, it was not, um, uh, uh, black folks were, were not more likely to be described as looting, but at the time, it seemed like this was happening. So this, and this begins to intensify some of the, the racial anger. Again, this happened over pre-existing fault lines, as will any, as will a wildfire, an earthquake, anything else. So these things are gonna lay bare our existing weaknesses and failings and injustices of our society. And so this is what New Orleans looked like just immediately prior to uh, Katrina hitting. So there's a clear difference between the typical black resident of New Orleans, or, or I should say the average black resident of New Orleans and the average white resident of New Orleans. And now, however you want to slice it, on average, whites are, whatever the index you want to pick, on average, white folks are better, better in terms of income, better in terms of education, um, et cetera, own their own homes, et cetera. And, and what we see is, um, uh, in, in places uh, like these different, we just mentioned these concentrated neighborhoods, the, the neighborhoods tend to have different um, racial makeups, right? So some neighborhoods are, so the neighborhoods that, that are dominated by white folks are, were, you know, almost 80% of the residents in those areas were white. Whereas in the other areas, um, only about one in five residents were white. And so we see this sort of clear existing fault lines. And then these stories start coming out, coming out about who is getting impacted more by this hurricane, by this natural disaster, or this, this human-caused disaster. And so we see, and this is where we, you, you then start to see it. So first was the story about the looting versus the, the finding. And the next thing that became very clear is, uh, so, okay, these are areas of the city that flooded, these are areas of the city that remain dry. And by dry, I don't mean they didn't get rainwater. I mean, they didn't get standing water. They didn't get levee broken water uh, coming onto their area. And so first and foremost, the vast majority of the city was flooded. So the largest chunk of the population lived in areas where there were st standing water. Um, but then have a look. So of those flooded areas, 76% of the residents in those areas were African-American. Whereas in the dry areas, it was closer to 50-50, right? And then again, as with all these things, we go down the list, education, income, and there is a clear difference, right? And so this, this uh, can look like this flood is attacking Black folks, right? The reality is Black folks were more likely to live in vulnerable areas, right? In areas less protected, in areas 
lower, lower elevationally, right? And so with so many things in our society, everything is caught up. Education is tied up with, with racial background, with, with you know, e economic, all this stuff comes together. And so there's a lot of autocorrelations, but ultimately what it translates to is um, different sections of, the, of our population experiencing these disasters differently. Different chunks of our society able to bounce back much more quickly than other aspects of our society. One of the key things about the COVID response, at least here in California and, and, and around the nation, but particularly here in California, is that we're very worried about this disparity, right? We're worried about the equity problem. So in addition to first and foremost, just getting everybody their shots, we also want to make sure that as we're on the path to getting everybody their shots, that it's not one group races ahead well, I mean, the doctors should race ahead, but in terms of, you know, once we get past those like first responder type folks, right? We've had one of the reasons we've been delayed in coming out of the purple into red, for example, in places like Ventura County and, and LA County and stuff is because we were trying to make sure that the, the most disenfranchised members of society were getting um, vaccinations in at least a, a roughly equivalent amount, uh, 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 proportion, right? So we weren't just given to the rich white folks in Beverly Hills uh, first, but that we were sort of hitting everybody. And so that that you know we we've, we've not we we've not solved that problem, but the fact that we recognize that as something we're working on is a big improvement. And things like Katrina have helped to raise that into people's consciousness. It didn't start with Katrina, it didn't end with Katrina, but but this was a, a huge part of the story of this disaster. And then this, and okay, then the last thing just to say is, so that was about different areas within the city. Also, it's important to mention that with this disaster and anything else, wildfires, earthquakes, whatever, uh, oftentimes the famous places get all the attention. Okay, so Hollywood, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, right? And that's understandable, right? Those places, iconic, culturally important, economically important. Okay, cool. But it can be very easy to forget about the places that don't have the famous people living there or don't have the super expensive houses. And that absolutely was part of the story of Katrina. So we have New Orleans and then everywhere else. Everywhere else, it was a story of a hurricane impact. In New Orleans, it was a story of a hurricane. It was a story of failed engineering, poor construction that was supposedly supposed to protect us that failed. And so there's, there's some good reasons why so much attention was directed at New Orleans, but it's important to say that the rest of the state was also impacted, the rest of the region was impacted. And I'll just say, because um, we're, we're getting tight on time here, I'll just say that um, um, the racial disparity and differences also occurs when we're talking about inside the city versus outside the city. So there's various ways we can break down our population structure, et cetera. Okay. So uh, went a little bit long there. Let's see, we had a good stopping point. Okay, so I'll, I'll just finish this last slide and then we'll take a little break here. So as we move into the recovery phase, right? The rebuilding and recovery phase. Um, what we see with the hurricane is initially, this is the population of what's known as the, 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 the greater New Orleans area, the greater metro area, which is more than just the, the technical city of New Orleans. It's the city plus the sort of immediate suburbs basically. And so uh, a lot of people, boom, Hurricane Katrina hits, most people leave, and then people come back, but not everybody comes back. So there's a significant amount of people that go away, they go to Atlanta, they come to California. We had people here at Channel Islands that registered that came from Tulane and other universities in, in um, Katrina, because Tulane was just flooded for the year. They said, we can't open back up. Um, so there's you know, some of that, but, and then people slowly start to dribble back Dribble back, dribble back, dribble back, dribble back, dribble back. But um, uh, it takes until a couple of years ago for us to get uh, to the level of population that we were uh, in 2005. And actually, for the first time, uh, just a year or so ago, we started the, the city of New Orleans, this greater metro area started shrinking again, which was the first time. Before then, we'd been on a growth, 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 growth phase. Um, and then as, as you'd expect, based talking about the, the preconditions, the recovery was has been uneven, right? So, um, so uh, the number of folks that came back uh, and how they came back were different. So, so 
uh, at this point in 2013 that this figure comes from, um, we we're roughly similar in the terms of the amount of white residents, at least numerically, the number of white residents that came back. But the, the poorest folks, folks with the least amount of means, had a harder time coming back. And so uh, I'll just say that there were all kinds of impacts. So uh, uh, many of these folks living in um, you know, less affluent communities, uh, you know, maybe their great grandma bought the house. And so they're living in the house and they've lived and their parents live in the house and they live in the house. Now your house is nuked, right? How am I going to rebuild? I got to get some federal loans. I got to get some federal assistance. So um, you have to prove you own the house. How do you prove you own your house if all your stuff is gone? And city hall was 12 feet underwater and all those records, paper records were all destroyed and the computer systems are all fried, right? So if you're wealthy on average, you have access to resources and can make some things work, right? But if you're poor, how are you going to solve that? Especially if you're in Atlanta, how are you going to solve that? You're stuck in Atlanta. How are you going to get back? Maybe you don't have a car. And then if you got back, what, you know, so, so anyway, so all that stuff played out and, and is actually continuing to play out in the long tail of the recovery from this disaster. Okay. With that, I will pause. Um, let's take, uh, let's take maybe, so I got, I got, uh, 10 12 on my clock let's maybe take an eight minute break instead of a full 10 so we'll come back at 10 20 and we'll pick it up uh from here and i'll pause the recording if you guys want to ask me any questions uh you're more than welcome to ask me any questions otherwise um 